pleasure today of introducing Robert Jensen, or as many people know him, Bob. Uh, Bob is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the School of Journalism. And if you follow his email updates list, which I recommend, or his uh, Facebook or Twitter, you'll know that he writes on a range of topics uh, from patriarchy, feminism, ecology, faith. Uh, some of his books include Getting Off, Pornography, and the End of Masculinity, uh, All My Bones Shake, um, and Citizens of the Empire. And um, he's also one of the founders of an activist resource center in Austin that is similar in some ways to the Houston Peace and Justice Center. It's called 5604 Manor. Um, and as a professor, I can definitely tell you that he has inspired at least one and many others, I'm sure, of his students to pursue careers in dissidence or uh, constructing positive change. And so I'm very grateful that he has come today and uh, welcome Dr. Robert Jensen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Melanie seems to have gotten things a little confused about how college students should function. You should suck up to your professor before he gives you a grade, <laughs> not after. Melanie's graduated. So uh, one of the pleasures I have at UT is to work with uh, students on projects such as an honors thesis. And I was able to supervise Melanie's. I can't tell you what she got because that's confidential, but she got an A. Because it was a really, <laughs> it was a really great project, um, and uh, was happy to be part of it. So thank you. Uh, we're running a little short of time, which means uh, I'm going to condense some things, and we're probably not going to take questions for this particular part of the program, in part because we have a panel coming up, and if you want to yell at me, you can do it during that. Um, First of all, who am I and, and what do I bring to the discussion about news media? Uh, I'm a former journalist, mainstream journalist. I was a newspaper reporter and editor at a list of very undistinguished newspapers where I had a very undistinguished career. Uh, you would not have seen my byline in the New York Times or the Washington Post. I never made it up that high. I did the work, uh, the most important work in contemporary mainstream journalism, which was filling the space between the ads on a daily basis day in and day out. So uh, I did work at a variety of newspapers and did get a look at how corporate commercial mainstream journalism works. After that, I went back to graduate school to study research and critique media. So I bring not only my experience as a journalist, but a, a systematic inquiry into the nature of journalism, especially its relationship to the political sphere. And I also do, like almost everybody here in the room, I'm sure, engage in various kinds of political activism which means inevitably I come into contact with journalists in that work. And so I come at this subject both as a former practitioner of journalism in the mainstream, a researcher and critic of that same mainstream journalism, and also someone who has to, on occasion, work, figure out how to work with journalists. Uh, you might be asking, well, why are we even talking about mainstream media anymore? After all, we know that the digital revolution and other changes in the landscape have really undermined the, the business model for journalism as it existed throughout the 20th century in the United States. That is, that advertising-supported corporate commercial, what we're calling mainstream journalism, uh, is on the ropes. Many of you probably know just from reading headlines that the revenue streams from for journalism have uh, eroded. Uh, journalism is laying off, not hiring more and more reporters. And even though the business model of contemporary journalism is crashing, it is still the case that the vast majority of people in this country still get the vast majority of their news from what we're going to call this mainstream media, corporate, corporately organized commercial ventures. Uh, even the so-called digital revolution, when you actually look at it, a lot of the, the websites people are visiting and online mobile products people are using come out of those mainstream or what are sometimes called legacy corporations. So even <clears throat> the New York Times, NBC, ABC, all of those which are described as legacy media from the old days are still 
uh, important players, both in their traditional forms and in some of those newer forms. All right. So we're going to focus not on all of journalism, because journalism can be defined in many ways and takes a lot of different forms. We're going to focus on that mainstream journalism in the United States. And we're going to say some critical things about it. Uh, now, that's never hard, because the one thing you can always be guaranteed, whatever audience you're speaking to in the United States, everybody hates the media. That's an easy sell. When you want to critique the media, right? It's you'll except for perhaps working journalists, and sometimes they hate the media more than anybody. So, but you never have a hard time if you start off by, well, what about those media in the U.S.? Because everybody knows, like, oh God, yeah, it sucks, it's awful, it's terrible. God, I can't believe it. I hate the media. Everybody hates the media. The problem is, people often hate the media for the wrong reasons. And what I want to do is walk through a certain analysis of how and for what reasons you should hate the media. All right. Now, in doing that, I also want to say that I come at this with a certain affection for the craft of journalism, which I picked up when I was 16 years old in high school and have never lost, that in critiquing certain aspects of contemporary media, I'm not critiquing the ideals of journalism, nor am I critiquing in some sort of broad brush way all of working journalists today. What I want to do is try and set out a framework for understanding why the media fail so routinely, especially fail in ways that people in this room are most aware of. But before we do that, I think if we're going to hate the media, if we're going to say they failed, it, I think it's incumbent on us to at least articulate in some sort of rough fashion what we expect from media. If we're going to say they fail, we should at least say failed on what criteria. And so I want to start with a list of three. Uh, I always, I only work in lists of three, by the way. So this is, I, I don't have PowerPoints because you don't need them. It, it's just a series of lists of three. I, I always say I'm a good Christian. Everything comes in, in threes. <laughs> so the first point I want to make, the first question I want to ask is, what do we need from journalism? And by we, I mean citizens in a, in a, in a country that claims to work in a democratic fashion. You know, we're a constitutional republic based on democratic ideals. We can talk all we like about how those ideals are not being fulfilled, but still there is a clear role for journalism in a democratic society. So when I say, what do we need from journalists, I mean it in that context. Right? And it seems to me we need three things, and these are the three criteria on which we can evaluate the performance of mainstream media. The first thing we need is an independent source of factual information. Now, there's a couple of important terms there, an independent source. This is a world awash in information, yes? The government, the corporate sector is churning out information, right? What we need is an independent source of information. The reason we don't necessarily believe information that comes from the government about government policy is government officials are obviously self-interested. The reason we don't believe corporate information when they're telling us about their products and services is they're self-interested. So the role of journalism is rooted in this, this need for an independent source of factual information. Yeah. We need to know what's going on in the world, and we need to know about that from people whom we can trust. But that's only the first thing we need because it's quite clear that factual information in and of itself is not of great value as we try to come to judgment as citizens in a democracy. We need context, we need analysis. A steady stream of facts may make you a great trivia player, but it doesn't make you a good citizen. Everybody knows this because everybody's been cornered at a party by somebody who knows a lot of facts and can't wait to tell you those facts, yes? Let me tell you a few things. I, I, I've been, you know, oh, you, no, th in this audience, you are those people who corner us in the, <laughs> I see, okay. No offense there, uh, but there, yeah. <laughs> but facts alone, information alone, doesn't help us understand how the world works. For that, we need analysis. We need context, historical context, social context, economic context. We need to know not only the facts of the world, but we need to know about how those facts fit together so we can try and figure out how the world works. The third thing I think we need from mainstream journal from journalism 
is exposure to the widest possible range of opinion that's available in the culture. And the reason I say that is because, again, if the goal of journalism is to help citizens come to judgment so that they can more effectively participate in self-governance, then we know that we don't form opinions, we don't come to those judgments by ourselves. If you, if you think about how you came to understand a certain moral or political question, it probably wasn't through going you know, to a cave somewhere and meditating. Right? We come to judgment by rubbing up against the judgments of other people, testing our own ideas, challenging other people. If we're going to come to meaningful judgments, we not only need factual information from an independent source, we not only need context and analysis, we need exposure to the widest possible range of opinion that's in the culture at any given moment. All right, so let's take that as the criteria on which we're gonna evaluate the performance of mainstream media, right? That independent source of factual information, independent from both government and the corporate sector. The analysis necessary to put that information in context and exposure to the widest possible range of opinion. So think of the mainstream media, let's focus here on questions of war and peace. What grade would you give the media on those three criteria? Okay, they fail. No, let's not, we don't, I don't think we could uh, probably need to poll the audience here. Every time there's a crisis involving war and peace, the failure of mainstream media is more obvious. I used to say, just going back and date me, I, when I first started doing talks on this, it was after the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq in 1991, and I used to say that the U.S. news media's performance in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq in 1991 was the greatest failure of journalism in my lifetime. Somebody got the joke. Every time there's another war, I have to kind of update that because it seems to get worse. But I think on those three criteria, you can see why we might suggest that the U.S. news media fails. It fails to provide that Im independent source of factual information. It is far too wedded in questions of war and peace, especially to government sources. It does not provide the kind of context that allows us to develop an analysis. In fact, contemporary mainstream journalism is often a kind of context stripping endeavor. And as to whether it exposes people to the widest range of opinion, that's probably the easiest one to demonstrate, in fact, it almost never does expose people to any opinion outside of a fairly narrow spectrum, especially in questions of U.S. aggression abroad. All right, so that's a quick run through of what we might expect from journalists. It helps us understand why we might want to critique journalism. The next question is why? Why do journalists so routinely fail? It is not because they're corrupt individuals. I've been a journalist, I've worked with lots of journalists, and although it will sound a bit cliched, some of my best friends are still journalists. And in, in any other human population, you will find some who are corrupt, some who are stupid, some who are lazy, and some who have bad personal hygiene, but that's not the problem. Most of the journalists I know go into journalism with a fairly idealistic set of goals. Uh, often those are beaten out of them pretty quickly. Uh, many journalists continue to try to do good work. This is not a critique of working journalists anymore as we were saying, you know, a critique of U.S. aggression abroad is uh, an attack on individual soldiers. Everybody's morally implicated in the choices they make, and I don't want to excuse them. Journalists, working journalists are morally implicated in the choices they make as well. As someone who teaches at the University of Texas at Austin, I know a lot about being morally implicated in bankrupt systems, uh, uh, so I'm not exempting myself from this as well. Yet we want to step back and look a little more systemically, structurally, institutionally at these questions. So what I'm going to do now is run through, I think, the best explanation that we have available to us of why mainstream journalism so routinely fails. This is going to work directly from something called the propaganda model, which was developed by Edward Herman. It was articulated in a book he co-wrote with Noam Chomsky called Manufacturing Consent, originally published in 1988. 
there's a new edition in 2002. I think I saw it out on the book table. Uh, the, the propaganda model that Herman developed and then ex articulated with Chomsky is really asking a very simple question. If we have a free press, and we do in the United States, make no mistake, the United States has expansive legal guarantees of freedom of both speech and press. They were hard won, they're not permanent, but we do have a rather expansive system of freedom of expression in the United States. If that's so, Herman and Chomsky ask, why, can the, why do the mainstream news media so often serve a propaganda function for concentrated power, both government power and corporate power? That is, if we are living in a free society, and we are in many ways, this isn't Hitler's Germany or Soviet Russia, if we're living in a free system, how can a free press so often serve a propaganda function? And that's the question they're pondering. And Ed Herman developed a model that offered five filters. So if you think about it, there's a lot of things that happen in the world every day, you know, many things happening. Not it, all of that becomes news. How do journalists choose from the various things that happen in the world to decide what is news? And Ed came up with a metaphor of filters, that these events out in the world have to pass through filters if they're going to be certified as news. Now, Ed, apparently not being a good Christian, had a five filter model. That's unacceptable. We must reduce the five to three because that's the only way I know how to think. Uh, so I'm going to take Ed's model and kind of just adapt it. Um, the, and, and the three filters I'm going to talk about, the three things that most influence the content of journalism. Now, notice we're not talking about the individual ideas of reporters, editors, or even owners. Right? We're not saying that media content is a direct product of the political ideas of the people producing it. That's the kind of critique you'll most often hear from the right. The right will point out that journalists are disproportionately liberal and democratic, therefore they produce news that's biased toward the liberal point of view. There are certain elements of that that are interesting, important, and worth exploring. But what I want to talk about is not the individual attributes of any working journalist, editor, or even owners. I want to talk about the way the system works. Right. There are three things, I think, to focus on. One is the institutional, the second is the professional, and the third is the ideological, hence the title of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to go through these really quickly. I had lots of examples, which we're not going to have time to talk about. I'm going to look to Bob. What I, we st okay, I got 10 minutes. I'm a professor. That means I'll take 20. That means also at the end, when there's 30 seconds left, I'll say any questions. No one will raise their hand because all they want me to do is shut up, and then I can sit down. This is how we professors operate. Okay, no, I will take 10. All right. The institutional aspect of this, again, mainstream journalism, to echo what I've already said, the vast majority of mainstream journalism pro is produced in a corporate setting for commercial purposes. It's organized hierarchically within a corporation, increasingly now not only a corporation that owns a particular media outlet, but corporations that are part of larger conglomerates. Right? The corporate concentration has intensified dramatically over the last 30 years, but also commercial, for-profit. And remember, what is the goal of a for-profit corporation in contemporary capitalism? It has one and only one goal, and that is to maximize profit. That's the institutional structure within which journalism works. It would be shocking if journalists weren't subordinated to the goals of the people who own them. Right? So. A lot of people, when you start talking about the role of corporate structure and commercial imperatives in journalism, will say, well, that's just a conspiracy theory, which I'm not a conspiracy theory theorist, but this is not a conspiracy theory. To say that the structure of an institution and its goal, especially when there is a singular goal, right, to say that that affects the practices within the institution is not a conspiracy theory. It's called common sense. Right? just like you would apply the same analysis to any other institution. All right, so there's an institutional filter. Right? As Chomsky likes to point out, what contemporary journalism is, is really just one set of corporations selling your attention 
to another set of corporations, the advertisers. And he asked the question, what kind of news are you likely to see when the system works that way? One set of corporations, increasingly large multi-conglomerates, uh, uh, selling the attention, preferably the attention of the most democratic, demographically desirable people, that is people with money, to another set of huge corporations, the advertisers. What picture of the world do you imagine would come out of that institutional structure? Probably not a radical communist uh, picture of the world. Okay. That's the institutional reality. The professional reality, journalists are trained to do their job in a certain way, just like people in any other profession. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, everybody gets socialized into a certain set of practices. Right? Now, journalists across time and space have used a wide range of those practices, but in contemporary mainstream journalism, again, these media outlets that provide the vast majority of news to the vast majority of people in this country, there's a set of professional practices that really center on the question of who is and who is not a legitimate source in pursuing the news. Who is and who is not a legitimate source for news is the crucial question. Because when journalists go out in, to investigate a topic, right, they have a limited amount of time and energy and their professional training points them to some people and not others. Right? And the people they are pointed to most routinely are people who we tend to call official sources, people who come from officially sanctioned institutions in the culture, in the kind of talk we're, uh, the kind of issues we're concerned about. That means the government. It means the various branches of the government. It means the military. It means the intelligence community. It means the think tanks that are often nothing more than mere adjuncts to those. And it often means the academic world, which is often just as subordinated to those kinds of institutions. So if the professional practices train journalists to seek out not only information, but even a definition of what is news from a very limited group of people who tend to reflect concentrated power, what do you expect the news is going to look like? Yeah. Now, I, again, to point out, I'm not saying that this means that every journalist walks in lockstep, right? through some command from the central authority. It's not that kind of system. Right? It's a liberal pluralist system, right? liberal in the big sense of the word, not liberal versus conservative. It's rather open-ended, and it's pluralist, but it's the nature of the institutions and the nature of the professional training that points journalists in one way or not the other. And all of this goes on, and this was actually what I wanted to spend the most time about, and now I'm going to talk about it in three minutes. The ideological filter, the fact that all of this goes on within a, a set of ideological assumptions that are not only promulgated by people in positions of concentrated power, but in fact tend to define the culture more generally. And the three that I think are most important here, right, we, could, we could spend, if we had more time, we could spend a lot of time talking, for instance, about the, the ideology of white supremacy that still defines the, the United States. That's one of the filters. We could talk about the ideology of patriarchy, which still defines the culture. But the three that are especially relevant here, I think, are what I always call the three E's. Oh, wait, another list of three. How convenient. And if your attention is flagging, this one is alliterative as well. I know that at the end of a talk, people I have trouble remembering the three E's, okay? Empire, economics, and ecology. The reigning ideology of the United States today on these three questions of empire, I think are relatively easy to summarize. Again, I'm not saying that every single person in the world believes what I'm about to say. Obviously, many of us here don't. I'm not saying that every single journalist absorbs it uncritically. We're talking about patterns. On empire, I think the underlying ideological assumption is the nobility of the US project, that the United States was a break from history. You know this. It's the, uh, I think, deeply pathological story of American exceptionalism, that somehow the United States, unlike other great powers, goes forward in the world not to expand its own wealth and power, but out of a noble mission, this shining city on the hill rhetoric, all of this, right, it's part of that exceptionalist rhetoric that's based on an ideology of the inherent nobility of the United States. That means that whatever we do, even if we do something bad, it's done for good reasons. In fact, you see this 
it, it's sort of the never ending story of the Vietnam War that the Vietnam War was not a barbaric US attack on the people of Indochina. It was, we made some mistakes, you know, we thought it was communism, dominoes, we got confused, who can blame us, you know, we were trying to do good, the world doesn't appreciate it, you know how the rhetoric tends to unfold. That's the ideological framework for news reporting in the country. Economics, here it's the deeply pathological commitment to capitalism to believe that this profoundly inhuman, anti-democratic and unsustainable system that we call capitalism is in fact the only way to organize an economy. Not only the only sane way, but literally now the ideology is it's the only possible way to organize an economy. Right? That's the economic ideology, which of course is not disconnected from the ideology of empire. The third, and in some ways the most troubling of these ideological assumptions, I think, concerns ecology, and that's the belief that the contemporary high energy, high technology society that is a product uh, in some sense of the last 10,000 years of history, ever since human beings started the, the tragic failure of agriculture to, we could talk for a long time about that, to the industrial revolution, the exploitation of the dense energy in coal oil and natural gas, the explosion of science and technology the idea that this is, in fact, the way a society should be organized, the idea that there can be no other way to organize a society, the rejection of the, even the idea that we might transition to a low energy society, the idea that we might challenge the notion of material consumption as the defining aspect of human life, right, that's another part of this ideology as well. You can think of these as the three crucial fundamentalisms that define the contemporary American ideological landscape. We always talk about religious fundamentalism. Yes, that's, we know what we mean by fundamentalism in that context. And I'm not here to defend religious fundamentalism. I identified myself as a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian. Right? And I'm not saying religious fundamentalism isn't a threat. But in some ways of the, what I would call the four fundamentalisms in the contemporary world, it's in some sense the least threatening. I think far more threatening are the fundamentalisms around these three questions. The national fundamentalism that's wrapped up in this pathological commitment to US nobility. The economic fundamentalism that's caught up in this pathological commitment to capitalism. And the technological fundamentalism that can see no other future for the human species except this high energy, high technology society. That's what we're up against in addition to all of the other problems that come when you're trying to organize to stop wars. The news media is one of those really fundamental problems we have to deal with. Thank you.